Desperate times call for desperate measures. In the most desperate hours of World War II, 80 volunteers stepped forward to try that which had never been done before, to launch one of the most daring raids in aerial combat history by flying fully loaded medium-range bombers from the deck of an aircraft carrier. It was a single mission of only 16 bombers. Its primary objective was to raise the morale of a nation stunned by the surprise attacks and sweeping conquests launched by the Japanese in December of 1941 by doing what was thought to be impossible at the time, bombing the Japanese home islands. As fate would have it, when they left the deck of that carrier in the nearly gale-force winds of an early April morning, the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders would do far more than boost morale they would trigger a series of tactical errors by the Japanese High Command. Errors destined to change the outcome of World War II in the Pacific. Eighty men, 68 years later, only six of them are still with us. Yet, their tradition dictates that all 80 of them gather, either in body or spirit, every year on the anniversary of that heroic and historic mission. Richard E. Cole, 95, from Dayton, Ohio, is the oldest surviving Raider. He was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot in the first plane to take off from the deck of the USS Hornet. Tom Griffin, from Green Bay, Wisconsin, was the navigator on Raider Airplane Number 9. Following the raid, he was shot down in Europe and spent nearly two years in a German prison camp. David Thatcher of Bridger, Montana is one of two Raiders awarded the Silver Star for Distinguished Gallantry in Action, for actions they took to save the lives of the seriously injured crew members aboard his B-25 airplane number seven. He is now 89 years old. Robert Height, the co-pilot of airplane number 16, was captured by the Japanese after the raid and sentenced to death. He was held for 40 months until liberated by American troops on August 20, 1945. He was born in Odell, Texas. Four men from the heartland, the northern plains, the mountain west, and the southwest. Men whose memories of an America united by the common cause of dire peril and those gained by flying a mission that would lift the nation's sagging spirits and turn the tide of war are as vivid today as they were in April 1942. When we get together, it seems like uh, the raid was yesterday. It's great to see the ones that are still living and uh, we pay homage to the ones that have passed on. I'm Gary Sinise, and this is Missions That Changed the War.
back. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. In December of 1941, Dick Cole was a young second lieutenant in the Army Air Corps Reserve, assigned to the 17th Bomb Group at Pendleton, Oregon. On Friday, the 5th of December, he had flown to March Field near Riverside, California on a three-day pass. We're given uh, what they used to call an open post, or you get like a three-day pass. We were in Hollywood at the time uh, uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. On uh, getting the notice that uh, uh, that had taken place, we re immediately reported back to March Field and took off and went back to Pendleton. And from Pendleton, they divided the, the group up and we went on submarine patrol, flying out of uh, Seattle, Portland, Everett, Washington. And we did that until about uh, first or second week of February. While Tom Griffin was majoring in political science at the University of Alabama, he went through the ROTC program. After graduation, he spent a year with an anti-aircraft unit based at Fort Sheridan, Illinois. In 1940, he transferred to the Army Air Corps and was trained in celestial navigation. In January of 1941, he too was assigned to Camp Pendleton, Oregon. They didn't have room for the officers out at the field at Pendleton, so we went into town and the townspeople rented bedrooms to uh, quite a number of the Air Force officers. And somebody came in about 3.30 in the afternoon and came rushing in the room and said, isn't it awful? And we said, what do you mean awful? And they, told us about this attack on Pearl Harbor. That's the first we knew of it. It's an odd thing. That night, we went downtown and went to a movie theater. There was a movie on we wanted to see. And while we were watching it, they stopped the movie and a man came up on the stage and said, all airmen from the field are ordered to report to the field immediately. But we got up and, and uh, departed and went back out to the field where our colonel gave us a little pep talk about what had happened and what was going to be expected of us, you know, that sort of thing. So that was my Pearl Harbor day. After graduating from Spring Lake High School in Earth, Texas in 1937 and completing three years of college, Robert Height enlisted as an aviation cadet at Lubbock, Texas on September 9, 1940. He got his pilot's wings on May 29, 1941. He too was assigned to the 17th Bomb Group at Pendleton when Pearl Harbor was attacked. David Thatcher was 19 years old when he went from his father's dairy farm in Billings, Montana to Missoula to enlist in the U.S. Army because he wanted to get away from dairy for a while. He was in airplane mechanics school in Lincoln, Nebraska on December 7, 1941. There was uh, 20 picked from the 17th group, five from each of the four squadrons that went there to go, go to airplane mechanic school. So some of us were in the movie then. That was Sunday, so when they come out of the movie in the afternoon, we heard it was had been bombed. No one expected something like that. The December 7th, 1941 was a Sunday. And Sundays in uh, flying school, when I was in advanced flying training at Victoria, Texas, uh, three or four of us decided to go downtown Victoria and have lunch down there instead of eating in the mess hall. The base we were on was brand new. We had the BOQs were were uh, primitive, and uh, the mess hall was not in good shape. And so we took the chance to go and get a nice lunch downtown. Well, one of the fellows it was, had a car. And we were allowed to have them by that time in our training. If you were about to graduate, you could buy a car if you had the money to do it. 
And uh, he had a radio in it, which I'd never seen before, in an automobile. And uh, we were riding around, getting back to the base, and the thing said that there was uh, uh, something that happened in Hawaii. And we just shrugged us. We didn't know what it was. And we never really didn't know much about Hawaii. C.V. Glines had been the official historian of the Doolittle Raider Association since 1972. He has authored three books on the raid and assisted Jimmy Doolittle in writing his autobiography. He was also a World War II Army Air Corps pilot. Next morning, on Monday morning, and we all went to uh, the base for our flying training, and always there was a notice for each of our flights as to uh, what the flying was going to be today. And the instructor had formation flying, gunnery, and he said in big letters he had written on the bottom of it, there's a war on, get on the ball, follow me. Well, that's, you know, that was about the, the norm, that was the announcement that we got that there was a war on, we were on wartime. Well, our job was to follow him and that's what we did. That, that day we went down the gunnery range, we did our gunnery, and then instead of coming back to Victoria, he headed out to the Caribbean. And well, I was sitting there flying my formation, it was six ship formation, and I wondered why we're going out to golf here. <laughs> we're not supposed to go into golf, we don't have uh, life jackets or anything. We followed him briefly, of course, and, and he finally made a turn and went back to Victoria. When we got on the ground, one of them had the nerve to ask us, sir, we're, were we lost after after gunnery at Matagorda Island? And he said, we were supposed to look for submarines. And he went, <laughs> and that, I think, we thought he was kidding. <laughs> and we really didn't understand what was going on. But we kept on with our training, that's all we were supposed to do. In his now memorialized speech to Congress on December 8, 1941, asking for a declaration of war, Franklin D. Roosevelt called the attack on Pearl Harbor unprovoked and dastardly. In Congress, only Montana Congresswoman Jeanette Rankin, the first woman to be elected to the United States House of Representatives, voted against entry into World War II. Treachery and success of the Pearl Harbor attack on December 7, 1941, wasn't the only bad news Americans had to process. Yesterday, the Japanese government also launched an attack against Malaya. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Hong Kong. Last night, Japanese forces attacked Guam. Last night, Japanese forces attacked the Philippine Islands. Last night, the Japanese attacked Wake Island. And this morning, the Japanese attacked Midway Island. Three days later, on December 11th, Germany and Italy declared war on the United States. In an instant, the hope of avoiding war held so fervently in so many American hearts was pulverized by a coordinated multi-front onslaught that had been years in the planning. After Pearl Harbor there was nothing but bad news coming. The Japanese uh, with a very small army, I mean we, we look back today and wonder how they could possibly have done what they did with the number of troops they employed, but they employed them in such a clever manner in joint operations. The Japanese army and navy which are infamous for not cooperating, were able to cooperate on this sort of island hopping, base hopping trip down through Indochina, down to Singapore. Tom Griffin of Cincinnati, Ohio, was the navigator on the ninth airplane to take off from the deck of the USS Hornet in the Doolittle Raid. The Doolittle Raid was so important because it was the first offensive action of our forces against the enemy. 
We were in this world war, and our, our allies in Russia were being driven back at this time towards their principal cities of Stalingrad and Leningrad and Moscow. In North Africa, the British were being driven back by Rommel and his German forces back toward Cairo. Things were looking bad there. In the Atlantic Ocean, German submarines were sinking our shipping wholesale. We didn't have the organization at that time to go after them successfully. We were losing all kinds of shipping. In the Pacific, after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, they went from one victory to another. They took over places like Guam, and they went down into the, uh, the, uh, into the Philippines and put a large army in the Philippines, and we're in the process of defeating our forces there. That was the springtime of 42. On December 7, 1941, a complete sense of betrayal consumed millions of Americans who had been arguing and demonstrating against America's entry into wars in either Europe or the Pacific. Many prominent Americans, such as aviation hero Charles Lindbergh, General Robert E. Wood of Sears Roebuck, Frank Lloyd Wright, Robert R. McCormick of the Chicago Tribune, and even future presidents John F. Kennedy and Gerald Ford became active in organizations such as the America First Committee that strongly advocated America's neutrality. We cannot allow the natural passions and prejudices of other peoples to lead our country to destruction. The Roosevelt administration is the third powerful group which has been carrying this country toward war. The undeclared acts of war perpetrated by Japan on the 7th and 8th of December, 1941, brought the isolationist movement in the United States to a swift and bitter end. Four days after the Pearl Harbor attack, the America First Committee dissolved itself virtually overnight America found itself at war on two fronts. No one was more determined to strike back at Japan than President Roosevelt. Almost two weeks to the hour after the Pearl Harbor attack, those responsible for planning and directing the mobilization of the country's military forces met with the President in his White House study. General George C. Marshall was Roosevelt's Army Chief of Staff. General Henry H. Hap Arnold was the Chief of Staff of the Army Air Forces. Admiral Ernest J. King served as Chief of Naval Operations. On this day, the trio would be joined by Harry Hopkins, President Roosevelt's Special Advisor, Admiral Harold R. Stark, Henry Stimson, Secretary of War, and Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox. Well, I guess the best way to get a joint mission is to have it come from the Commander-in-Chief, and uh, President Roosevelt was anxious to have some retribution. He wanted to know, the people of the United States to know, that we weren't flat on our backs and that we could do something. This was early in December, uh, maybe two weeks after Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt emphasized that he wanted a bombing raid on the home islands of Japan as soon as possible. This request, repeated over and over again in the weeks following, was transmitted to the respective staffs of Marshall, King, and Arnold each time they returned to their offices. The biggest obstacle to a retaliatory bombing mission was that no working Allied air base was close enough to Japan to allow even our longest range bombers to get there. Ironically, the flash of insight that led to the Doolittle raid did not come from an aviator, but a Navy submariner. Captain Francis Lowe, the operations officer on the staff of Admiral Ernest J. King, on a trip to the Naval Yard at Norfolk, Virginia, noticed that the Army Air Corps twin-engine bombers were making passes over an aircraft carrier silhouette, which had been painted on the runway. In a rare interview following the war, Lowe gave his account of what he saw. I had occasion to fly from Washington to Norfolk to look into the redness of one of our new carriers, 
And as we took off from the airstrip to return to Washington and were circling to gain altitude, I noticed down below me the outline of a carrier deck. This was not unusual because we had them painted on many landing fields so that young aviators who were going to carriers would learn how small such a deck was. But also making passes or appearing to make passes over this carrier deck were some twin engine bombers that looked like B-25s or B-26s. Here was born, I would say, the, the concept of the raid. One might call it fortuitous association because I never would have thought of it had I not seen the bombers passing over the carrier deck. Admiral King had been using the USS Vixen, a gunboat moored at the Washington shipyard as his flagship and second office. Several of his staff were working and living aboard the ship. On the evening of January 10th, 1942, after King had retired to his cabin, Lowe decided to share his fortuitous association. King reportedly had a stern demeanor and was not easily approachable. Lowe was not an aviator. He did not know how the Admiral would receive his idea. Lowe told King that though Navy fighters had an operating radius of only 300 miles off an aircraft carrier, in Norfolk he had observed twin-engine army bombers, which had a much greater range, practicing over the carrier profile on the runway. What if they could actually operate off a carrier? What if the Navy could give the long-range Army Air Corps bombers a ride within range of the Japanese home islands, setting them up for a sea-based strike? On January 10th, 1942, while Francis Lowe was sharing his ideas with Admiral King in Washington, D.C., Tom Griffin, Dick Cole, David Thatcher, Robert Height, and the rest of the 17th Bombardment Group were flying out of Tacoma, Washington and Portland, Oregon, patrolling for threats to the west coast of the United States. At the time of uh, Pearl Harbor, we spent the next six weeks, our, our group, flying out from Tacoma, Washington and Portland, Oregon, looking for whatever might show up. The Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, and as far as we knew, they would come and attack the west coast of America. But of course, they had other plans. They thought they had done enough damage and they, they could go elsewhere in the Pacific and uh, more or less uh, take over the Pacific, which they did. Back in Washington, somewhat to Francis Lowe's surprise, Admiral King directed him to talk to Captain Donald Duncan, King's Air Operations Officer, the very next morning about his idea. He added sternly, don't tell anyone about this. of the attack on Pearl Harbor. President Roosevelt pressed the U.S. military for a plan to strike back against the Japanese homeland. Francis Lowe, a Navy captain, after watching twin-engine bombers making passes over the outline of an aircraft carrier on a runway near Norfolk, Virginia, suggested a bombing strike might be possible from the deck of a carrier. Admiral King, Chief of Naval Operations, told Lowe to explore the idea with Donald Duncan, his air operations officer, and he told him something else. Don't tell anyone about this. Lowe had two pertinent questions for Duncan. First, can an army medium-range bomber land aboard a carrier? Second, can a land-based bomber, loaded with bombs and crew, take off from a carrier deck? The answer to the first question was a quick no. The risk of landing airplanes that size on a carrier was too high, but even if it were possible, the elevator would not be able to get the bombers below decks to make room for other landings. But a carrier takeoff? That was another matter. 
In this rare archival footage, Duncan recalls being contacted by Lowe. When Captain Lowe, the operations officer on Admiral King's staff, told me that he and the Admiral had been discussing the possibility of launching Army bombers from carrier decks to hit Japan and told me that the Admiral wanted me to investigate it and write up a concept of operation. Checked over the various types of Army bombers that we might use and came up with the answer that the B-25 was probably the best bet. Uh, they looked at a bunch of airplanes, uh, the, the B-18, which was a terrible airplane for a bombing mission, uh, and uh, the B-26, which had a suspect reputation. But the B-25 seemed to fill the bill, the North American B-25. When uh, the B-25 came about, uh, it was like a, a kick in the pants, uh, as far as maneuverability and speed and Fun to fly. The Mitchell B-25 was one of the iconic success stories of World War II. By the end of its production, nearly 10,000 various models of it had been built. It was used by the Allied Air Forces in every theater of the war. It served across four decades. The B-25 is developed by North American Aviation with a very easy airplane to fly. Uh, it was far easier to fly than the Marauder, the B-26 Marauder. had a much lower wing loading and with the lower wing load it could get off in shorter distances. The Marauder needed much longer runways, had to land a lot faster airspeeds. Uh, but you could take a young pilot right out of advanced training with a couple hundred hours in his logbook, put him in a B-25, very quickly transition, learn his combat skills and send him off to war as a competent combat pilot. The B-25, properly modified, could carry 2,000 pounds of bombs and make a 2,000-mile flight if extra gas tanks were installed. Normally, it would take at least 1,200 feet of runway with that kind of load. If it were lightened, however, it might be made to leap off in a little over a third of that distance, especially with a forward speed of a carrier and a wind of about 25 knots. Lowe and Duncan knew a test would be required. Under normal circumstances, such a test flight would not be difficult to conduct. But these were not normal circumstances. Both men had Admiral King's words ringing in their ears. Don't mention this to another soul. On January 31, 1942, Captain Duncan flew to Norfolk. The USS Hornet, the Navy's newest aircraft carrier, was due there to be readied for her first mission. He went aboard the Hornet the afternoon of February 1st and explained the test to Mark A. Mitcher, the Hornet's skipper. Duncan had made arrangement with Hap Arnold's office to have three B-25s waiting when the carrier arrived. The Army Air Corps chose Lieutenant John Fitzgerald to head the test crews. He was a 1940 graduate of the Advanced Flying School with over 400 hours in B-25s. In Norfolk, Fitzgerald and his fellow pilots made several practice runs at an auxiliary airfield before going aboard the carrier. One of the test airplanes lost an engine during these drills, leaving only the two planes flown by Fitzgerald and Lieutenant James F. McCarthy to make the historic first takeoffs of Army Air Corps multi-engine bombers from a Navy ship. The surprising performance of the B-25 nearly led to disaster when the takeoffs were attempted. Fitzgerald's plane leapt off the deck so quickly and so high, its right wing nearly flew into the tower that overhung the flight deck. Fitzgerald later recalled, I was surprised to observe that we had been provided almost 500 feet of usable deck and that the plane's airspeed indicator showed about 45 miles per hour just sitting there. When I got the go signal, I let the brakes off and was almost immediately airborne. One thing that worried me, though, was the projection of the island out over the flight deck. The wing of my plane rose so rapidly that I thought I was going to strike this projection. I pushed the control column forward, and the wing just barely passed underneath. I climbed and circled back to watch Lieutenant McCarthy take off. 
it was now established that the B-25 bombers could indeed take off from a carrier deck. But what would happen when they were weighted with a full crew, bombs, and an expanded fuel load? That question would soon become the sole focus of the diminutive, brilliant man whose name would eventually be memorialized by this mission that changed the war. Immediately following the attack on the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, President Franklin D. Roosevelt began pressing his military leadership for a plan to conduct a retaliatory airstrike against the Japanese homelands. With no Allied air base within striking distance of Japan, two naval officers on Admiral King's staff had successfully tested the takeoff of B-25 bombers from the deck of an aircraft carrier. It was something never before tried in the history of aerial warfare. To plan the mission and train the crews, Chief of Staff of the Army Air Forces, Henry Hap Arnold, made a surprise choice. He turned to a man who had once resigned his Army Air Corps commission in order to enter private business. He chose one of America's most famous aviators, James H. Doolittle. In doing so, Arnold tapped a man who is not only a brilliant aviation tactician, history would bear witness that he also identified one of the most revered and visionary leaders of the modern American military. And, uh, it was very difficult to believe when the rumors started then it was led by Jimmy Doolittle. Jimmy Doolittle, the racing pilot? Another impossibility. It would just seem like it was a false rumor. But um, it, it took place and uh, all of these impossibility things happened through the leadership the planning of the then Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle. Former racing pilot, devil may care, couldn't care less, we go. It was not that way. He was master of the calculated risk. As a kid growing up in Dayton, Ohio, Dick Cole used to ride his bicycle to a levee above McCook Field to watch the Army Air Corps test pilots including Jimmy Doolittle. Some of the old pilots like McCready, Doolittle, and Spatz uh, flew in and out of there uh, when they were testing the uh, air-to-air air refueling. And they flew for 26 days, something like that. But anyway, that was one of the, the uh, uh, pastimes that I had when I was a kid. For something like this, there's an element of show in it. There's an element of uh, innovation, and they, they selected the guy who could combine leadership and innovation and great flying characteristics in Jimmy Doolittle. And oddly enough, uh, sort of on the outs, uh, Jimmy Doolittle at the time uh, had rejoined the Air Force, but he had gotten out because after, I think it was 11 years as a first lieutenant, he decided he had to make some money for his family and, and got out during the 30s. And to the hardcore who had stayed in, including General Arnold, uh, that wasn't the thing to do, you know, he, he, he was sort of uh, not uh, in the best favor at the time. James Harold Doolittle was born in Alameda, California on December 14, 1896. His father was a carpenter who went to Alaska in search of gold. After joining his father in Nome, at age 11, Doolittle moved with his mother to Los Angeles. In 1917, at the age of 21, Doolittle, who had had a brief career as a professional boxer, enlisted in the Army Signal Enlisted Reserve Corps to train as a pilot. He was quickly promoted to lieutenant. He served in the Army Air Corps from 1917 to 1930, when he became a major in the Army Air Corps Reserves. 
Flying was Jimmy Doolittle's passion. In 1922, he made the first cross-country crossing in under 24 hours. He became the first person to win all major aviation racing trophies. He won the Schneider Trophy in 1925 and the Bendix Trophy in 1931. In 1932, he won the Thompson Trophy, flying a closed course race in Cleveland, an average of 252 miles per hour in the GBR1 Racer. Doolittle made aviation history on September 24, 1929, when he became the first person to take off, fly, and land an airplane entirely by instruments. He flew a 15-minute course around Mitchell Field on Long Island in a modified NY-2 Husky. In his personal logbook, he modestly referred to the watershed accomplishment as a blind flying exhibition. After leaving the military in 1930, Doolittle went to work for Shell Oil Corporation to establish an aeronautical branch. In this capacity, he was given credit for leading the company to develop 100 octane fuel for aviation. Between the two world wars, the Army Air Corps had been relegated to the job of flying the mail. Doolittle knew that it was falling behind the rest of the world's flying forces. New, more powerful engines were needed, but there was no way to efficiently fuel them. In his 1991 autobiography, Doolittle wrote, I was concerned that we were falling behind other nations in military aeronautics and that we should be looking forward to the development of more powerful engines for warplanes so that heavier loads could be carried faster. The Army Air Corps was not even a third-rate air force compared with the air forces of other nations. At Doolittle's urging, Shell made the first delivery of 100 octane rated fuel to the Army Air Corps for test purposes in 1934. When Doolittle traveled to Germany on shell business, he found a nation bristling with militarism. He saw Boy Scout troops that had been converted to Hitler Youth, drilling as soldiers and singing Nazi war songs. He met German pilots who openly talked of the inevitability of war in Europe and who bluntly asked him what the United States would do about it. Jimmy Doolittle knew Hap Arnold, the chief of the Army Air Force, as well. Arnold had been his commanding officer at Rockwell Field near San Diego following World War I. Doolittle visited Arnold and told him he believed that America's involvement in the war in Europe was inevitable. September 1st, 1939, two weeks after Doolittle's conversation with Arnold, the Germans marched into Poland and 1,400 Luftwaffe planes bombed and strafed a stunned population. In May of 1940, the German Blitzkrieg extended into the Netherlands, Belgium, and France. On the 16th of May, in a speech before Congress, President Roosevelt called for a program that would eventually produce at least 50,000 airplanes a year. A little over two weeks after that, on June 4, 1940, Ira Aker, General Arnold's executive officer wrote Jimmy Doolittle asking him to return to active duty on July 1st. At 44 years of age, Jimmy Doolittle became a U.S. Army Air Corps officer for the second time, beginning a journey whose outcome was far from certain. Jimmy Doolittle was a tremendous man, uh, a big man in a little man's body, you might say, uh, very intelligent, never seemed to have any element of fear in his makeup whatsoever. You know, he had, he had occasion to fly the wings off of two planes he had to bail out of in the 1920s, those old crates. And then, of course, over to China, he bailed out again. And we thought, boy, that old man, 46 years old, bailed out of aircraft. But he was a, he knew no fear, and he was just an outstanding leader in every respect. Well, I think people don't realize that Jimmy Doolittle had a doctorate from MIT that he had earned, doctor of science degree in aeronautical engineering. 
This man was an educated individual. He had a master's, a bachelor's, a master's, and then a doctorate. Everybody knew who General Doodle was, that he was one of the famous pilots, and he was going to be the leader of our raid. So everybody in our outfit volunteered to go with Jimmy Doodle. <laughs> Doolittle re-entered the Air Corps as a major. His initial assignments seemed to be directly related to President Roosevelt's goal to make the United States the arsenal of democracy. Hap Arnold knew that Doolittle's technical knowledge and industrial experience uniquely qualified him to play a key role in the conversion of domestic manufacturing to wartime production. Captains Lowe and Duncan brought the concept of the raid to Hap Arnold on January 17th. The general immediately sent for Jimmy Doolittle. He began with a single question. What airplane have we got that could take off in 500 feet with a 2,000 pound bomb load and fly 2,000 miles? A day later, Doolittle independently arrived at the same conclusion as had Lowe and Duncan. The B-25 was the only alternative. Arnold briefed Doolittle on the concept of the raid and added, Jim, I need someone to take this project over, get the planes modified, and train the crews. On January 2nd, 1942, Japan captured Manila in the Philippines. On January 12th, Japan invaded Burma. On January 20th, Germany held the Von Say Conference in a Berlin suburb to find a final solution for the Jews. On January 25th, Japan invaded the Solomons. In the 13th century, Mongolian invaders were driven back from Japan, not by defenses, but by the Japanese typhoon season. Since that time, the militarists in Japan had told the people that a kamikaze, or divine wind, protected their nation. As the Japanese swept through the Pacific with frightening speed, this long-held belief in a national invincibility and the invulnerability of the home islands was mightily reinforced. What the Japanese high command did not know was, a half a world away, an aeronautical genius with a gift for leadership, and 80 brave souls who had come under his command had a bold plan to shatter that facade. In doing so, they would receive a life-saving lift from a divine wind of their own. A lift that would allow them to complete a mission that changed the war. When they announced that they wanted volunteers, the whole group volunteered, including the, the uh, group commander. And everybody in the 17th Bomb, we were in the 17th Bomb group, wanted to go with Jimmy Doolittle. Originally, we were supposed to take off in the evening, bomb Japan at night, and be over reach China the next morning. But it didn't turn out that way. You don't take off on a mission like this without a light at the end of the tunnel. We all thought that somehow we'd get out of it. 